Roger Williams University is hosting a crisis management seminar on May 3rd at their Providence campus. Crises, whether a natural disaster, cyber attack, or financial instability, can have severe repercussions if not handled properly. This is where crisis management plays a pivotal role. Join Roger Williams' MBA students and expert speakers to learn how to prepare for the unexpected. The program is totally free and open to the public. You can register online at rwu.edu slash events slash crisis dash management dash symposium. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Time to talk Historic Cemetery Month. And look, Rhode Island is filled with so many different venues to so many different historic cemeteries that some are known, some are documented, some are not known, undiscovered, some are known and remains kind of off the grid. And there's, there's a lot that we can learn, of course, obviously from historic cemeteries, but, um, you know, we're, we're in a position where we have this incredible opportunity in front of us. And I don't think most people really understand the value of it. So we're joined by Deb Suggs, who has really broadly speaking, we can categorize as an historian, but I guess give your full throttle credentials, full disclosure, we're also cousins. So, I mean, that makes that, I guess that's the only credential you really need, but at the the, the end of the day, but, you know, you know, I guess set, set up, set the table for who you are and the work that you do in this space. Sure. Thanks, Bill. And yes, we are cousins. Um, we yes. could go into a whole spiel about our, our cousin relationship. But as far as um, history in Rhode Island history, so um, I am very interested. I've always been interested in Rhode Island history. In fact, that was my undergraduate major. I majored in history at Rhode Island College and really focused my um, research work on Rhode Island history. I am a native Rhode Island, and I'd like to say, Bill, that our family has been in the state the full 300 plus years. So I yep. we say um, <laughs> we sailed over on the Mayflower. We walked over to Rhode Island and bang, here we are kind of thing and (laughs) and that's where we are so over the last um 10 years or so i've been doing um workshops and presentations on um different aspects of rhode island history so including different um little day trips around rhode island monuments that people don't know about genealogy work related to rhode island um and some other things and and along the way I um, started visiting slightly the the historic cemeteries, ones that you see driving down and looking around and just fascinated. Quite frankly, my fascination was the names of people. I I love old historic names, what people name their families. Um, Met a gentleman who was on the Rhode Island Historic Cemetery Commission and did some historic cleanup with him of some of these cemeteries. And um, then he asked me if I wanted to be... um, attend commission meetings. And so fast forward, I am now um, the one of the Washington County commissioners for the Rhode Island Historic Cemetery Commission. The commission itself is um, was established by um, legislation and each of the counties in Rhode Island have one or two commissioners south of Washington County because of the size, there were three of us. And I work primarily with Narragansett, South Kingston and North Kingston. So um, really my role in cemeteries with cemetery work is to um, really get the word out about cemeteries. People think they'll contact me and say, hey, I want cemetery A, B, or C cleaned up. And that's actually not necessarily my role. My role is really to talk about the preservation of cemeteries, to stop um, the building of homes and houses and businesses on cemeteries. And we can talk about some of that work to really talk about the history. I um, view cemeteries personally and tell people in all my presentations, to me, cemeteries are outdoor museums. Mm. The, the, the cemetery provides information. The people buried in cemetery are our history, our past, and it's an outdoor museum when I'm going. I treat it like an outdoor museum. Um, and I have little things that I do when I go to cemeteries, each one that really um, expands my knowledge of the state and about what was happening during the time period. And most importantly for me, it's also honoring the people that are buried there. Absolutely. And there's, there's like you said, there's so many uh, historic cemeteries that you can find. There's always the, the sign, the state sign, and it's numbered. And it's a really fascinating space to be in. And I would encourage anybody to spend time there and then do the back work and say, all right, who was this person? What's their tie to this area? What's their what's their story, right? But 
There's also, and you kind of alluded to it, a lot of cemeteries that are off the grid. Oftentimes these are indigenous or frankly slave cemeteries. And that's a space that I know you've done a lot of work in as well. We've even had discussions about this, whether it's just, it's artifacts or cemeteries themselves in terms of the Narragansett tribe where South County Hospital is trying to build a parking lot over an historic site. So talk about some of the preservation work in areas that don't have that that kind of iconic signage that most people associate historic cemeteries with. So definitely that's an issue. So let, let me talk quickly about the um, cemeteries of enslaved people. And I'll tell you a quick story how that piqued my interest. I work at the University of Rhode Island. I've been here 15 years now. Um, mm-hmm. About three years ago, I took a campus tour with um, Lorenz Spears, who works, who is the um, person, everybody knows Loren, who is the um, president, general manager, whatever her exact title is, the Tomaquag Museum. She's also adjuncts here at URI. So she did a Native American tour around the URI campus. And we went down to the Ryan Center and she pointed out a rather large space that was believed to be, and um, there's some documentation, but it was believed to be the cemetery of the enslaved um, people for the Niles family. Niles family were one of the first um, settlers of Southern Washington County. They came with the, Mr. Niles was with Roger Williams. And so um, I probably walked by that cemetery um a thousand times i've season tickets to all the sporting events a thousand times and never noticed the cemetery so that really piqued my interest how often are we walking by these cemeteries and i I challenge how much rhode islanders really know about our slave past the slave past so one of the things i started to do was really start to look up in the cemetery um, database cemeteries that were designated cemeteries of uh, african americans of native americans of enslaved people and then trying to visit them the sad thing about it bill is nine out of ten that i went to visit that were even documented are no longer there and is particularly down here in South County, there is a slave, an enslaved person, slave cemetery, they call it. That was, it's maybe a three minute ride from my house. It was considered one of the largest cemeteries of enslaved people. It was called the Stanton Gardner family plot, slave plot. Um, One of the largest in New England estimated close to 120 to 160 burial grounds there. This cemetery is no longer in existence which in in real terms means somebody built their houses on it. Mm. Um, There is a cemetery, a slave person cemetery, that's also very large. It was called the Doc Ray Family Cemetery in South Kingston. The family cemetery is still there. The enslaved person cemetery is gone. And that can be Mm. Tuckertown Park. I could go on and on. These cemeteries are gone. So I said those cemeteries of enslaved people that are still there, we need to document them. They may disappear, but we at least need to know that they're there and we at least need to try to understand, acknowledge the people that are buried there. They weren't acknowledged as full humans 300 plus years ago. We need to do that now. Hmm. And that absolutely and that and as far as Narragansett or Native American cemeteries, some are some are documented. Some are not documented. Many of the Native American cemeteries are not documented at the request of the tribes because people looted. People said, oh, that's a Native American cemetery. I'll dig up and take the artifacts that are located there. So the tribe said, please, please don't identify our cemeteries. And that's that's their right. And it's an understandable right. But there's some fascinating histories that that, you know, let yourself go to these cemeteries and just think, think about the people there. There is a cemetery of an um we'll call it formerly enslaved, former um, Niles folks. If you ever go to Teft Historical Park, there's an African-American cemetery. Um, There's a young man that's buried there who died at 18 on his way off to fight the Civil War. He is, he was born free, but his family were slaves. So that that's important that we remember his cemetery. And we've been out there a couple of times cleaning it and flagging it and doing all sorts of things as a memory for his family sacrifice unwilling sacrifice and his willing sacrifice to remain free. Mm, it's such an important component of our history. And look, Rhode Island history is really fascinating. There's there's always, there's an endless amount of things to explore and to discuss. And we have a unique history, even amongst New England colonies and states. And you go back even further than that in, in parallel with the indigenous history here. And, you know, look, we had 
there were enslaved people in Rhode Island, and this debate really came to the public's attention during the Providence Plantations discussion, another initiative that you were heavily involved in, the removal of Providence Plantations from our state's name. And some people would say, you know, oh, well, we never, you know, a plantation is a giant farm. Well, guess who worked those farms? Exactly. And it's important to remind ourselves of that history, not for this false idea that everybody's got to walk around, you know, with their head down, but to the more we understand about ourselves and our backstory, the more that we can correct the mistake, the mistakes and the mishaps of the past and make sure that they never happen again. And that also we're honoring people with dignity in a way that they weren't honored with dignity in their lifetime. That's exactly it. I have a really a standard policy when I'm doing genealogy, when I'm looking at cemeteries, when I'm doing ev- everything in history. I ask nobody to apologize for what happened in the past. I ask them to understand what what happened in the past and recognize. So I am not going to take, and I take people on tours of cemeteries. I don't go to these cemeteries saying, apologize for this. But I say, think about this. And more importantly, think about the people that were buried there, whether they're enslaved people, whether they are colonists, whatever, and take a moment to think about them, think about their lives and, and think about how much things have changed or how little things have changed. And again, right. not to apologize, not to, it's not about apology because they're not here anymore. And quite frankly, I always tell people, it's not really much I could do about what happened 300 years ago, but I can right. pay attention to what's happening now and bring this to bring history to 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 now to, so people understand, you know, how that impacts um, people, generations, it, it's generational. There is a saying, Bill, um, and it's actually it was a part of a University of Georgia research project on genealogy that I applied to cemeteries, the importance of cemeteries and my genealogy work. People forget after three generations, very few people know a history past of three generations. So if you're looking at your own family, you might know a little bit of history about your great grandparents. And then it starts slipping away. And cemeteries are a place where you learn history. And and as you know, one of the first things I did with cemeteries is literally go through my genealogy and make a point of visiting any cemetery that was in my family history, which is easy because I can say 300 years of Rhode Island. Plus, it's not that hard to find. Um, and just get to know, get to know these people. And that means looking at their um, cemeteries, looking at their headstones, and then doing a little research on them, just getting to know. And that's one of my personal rules. And when I do a class, I say to people, I'll stop it. And you know this, I'll stop at a historical cemetery anywhere, anytime. If I see that white sign, I'm all in. And I make a point to focus (laughs) at least on one person and to go home um, and say, I met this one person. I want to know all about them and do as much research. Sometimes there's nothing on a person and that's okay. And sometimes there's so much information. Um, Funny story. I was driving through West Greenwich And I saw in the distance, yes, the distance, a cemetery sign. So I pulled over on the side of the road and I I walked up the road and I um, just met, quote unquote, looking around the cemetery, meeting some fascinating figures. And I met somebody, um, yes, he's been dead 300 years. So met is a funny word, called Theopolis (laughs) Whaley. So Theopolis Whaley, I, I was thinking, what kind of name is Theopolis from the late 1600s? Mm. Well, come to find out that was his um, a made up name. He made that name up. He is was believed to be part of the contingency or the group of men that were involved in the beheading of King Charles one during the um, Oliver Cromwell resolution. The Whaley family were compatriots or friends of or however you want to define them of Oliver Cromwell. And after um, the English Civil War and after Cromwell's rule in England, all the people that helped him in the overthrow of the government were considered traitors. So they all ran. And if you do a little research about Theopolis, and it was literally going to Google and typing his name in, and all this information pack came up about this gentleman, about people looking for him. He started in Virginia. All this information, it was a quick Google search. And this gentleman is buried in the woods in West Greenwich. And that's the history we don't know. Right. And there's, I'm sure there's so many examples that are very similar to that. 
So for anybody out there that says that this has piqued their interest and they want to do one, go on a tour with you, um, how do they get a hold of you and, and what, what's sort of the, the process for your tours? Sure. So what I would recommend anybody who's interested in historical cemeteries, anything about them, they take a moment to go to the um, Rhode Island Historical Cemetery Commission's website. Just type it into Google or a search engine, it will come up. It is considered one of the best cemetery, historical cemetery websites in the country and it's won awards. You'll find on that page, first of all, a list of all the cemeteries that have been documented in Rhode Island, and that's thousands, and we believe there are still thousands missing. In your backyard, in your woods, people are still tripping over historical cemeteries. You'll see an event page, and for the next month, Bill, almost every county and every town has some type of event going on. So there's events um, from cemetery cleanups, small cleanups, large cleanups, there's lecture series, there's tours. North Burial Ground in Providence has an amazing array of programs that I'm, I'm super looking forward to. Myself, I'm doing some tours of um, light, I call them light hiking tours. History hikes, I call them, but they're light tours of some of the historical cemeteries in South County. I'm doing Teff Farm. I am doing um, Gibson Avenue Cemetery in Narragansett, which for most of us who grew up down here, we know that as Druid's Dream. I'm yep. doing the Murder Lot in Exeter. So there's some cool things, and I'm doing the um, a tour around the Quaker Cemetery in Perryville. So those are those are some of the ones I'm doing. But there's opportunities. If you want to get down and dirty in cemetery cleaning, there's a cleaning a week. If you want to know how to preserve cemetery stones, there's there's that information. There's tours, there's lectures. So if people go to that web page and go to the event page, do something. Enjoy. Um, you know, North Burial Ground is doing a um, picnic at North at the cemetery North Burial Ground. That's in June in the um in the 1800s, that was commonplace to picnic at cemeteries. So I'm super excited about that. So tons of stuff, just visit that webpage and then take a look at your town and find a listing of cemeteries. I just published a book, um, finished last year, um, documenting all the his historical cemeteries for Revolutionary War veterans in South Kingston and Narragansett. Um, there were hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of, of Revolutionary War veterans that lived in these towns, many of whom were major players in the Revolutionary War, who, again, three generations we forget about. That, yeah, and that's the big thing as well, that three generations. It makes so much sense, and it's it, I, I totally agree. You don't think much past that point, but your lineage, it's real, and it informs where we are today and where we're going. And not only is it fun, but I think it's also really important work that you're doing, so— Definitely. Much appreciated. I hope your listeners and I hope you will join us for one or two of the tours, or if not, just do something, something, a little bit of something is um, helpful to get the word out. And it's also fun. It's spring. It's a great spring activity. Absolutely. Deb Suggs, Cemetery Month, Historic Cemetery Month, and make sure you get involved in some of these programs because it's, it's just super cool. And it's, by the way, it's also not very expensive. No. Almost every single program is free. Um, I would say 99% of them are free. There's a small cost to some of the events, but almost everything is free with a, you know, for a cleanup, bring your shovel, bring your rake and some gloves for a hike, bring your bug spray. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.